and I'm delighted to welcome you all to the Blavatnik School. For those of you who don't know, we are a school dedicated to improving government around the world. And our students, faculty, staff, and others are, are working on that mission in their teaching, in their research, and of course in their engagement with the policy world. And today, tonight, we have before us two of the, perhaps the biggest questions that governments and indeed all of societies are facing all around the world. How do we make societies that are inclusive, socially, and sustainable environmentally? And how do we do that, particularly now, in an age where if you look around the world, if you read the headlines, if you listen to the radio, if you look on the news, it doesn't look like we're doing a great job on social inclusion or environmental sustainability. Indeed, we often see um, more bad news on these fronts than good news, uh, worries about rising populism, rising nationalism, rising violence in many societies around the world, and of course, internationally as well. So how can we confront this challenge? How can we work on it? We're delighted tonight to be able to talk about these very big questions with a fantastic group of people um, who come to us from the Club de Madrid. For those of you who don't know, the Club de Madrid is an organization of former heads of state and heads of government, about 100 um, former members, uh, members from different democracies around the world that are dedicating their time and effort to out of office working on the world's big challenges. So we at the Blavatnik School see this as a fantastic opportunity to welcome back some um, ex exemplary public servants to talk about these massive issues. And we here um, hope that in our student body, some of you here will have some future members of the Club de Madrid perhaps joining you at some point. Um, but it's wonderful to hear from the current members um, to give you some thoughts on how to get there. Um, I don't want to say too much because we have a lot of fascinating content to get through. So let me just briefly um, introduce our speakers. First, we're going to hear from Prime Minister Wim Kok, who was Prime Minister of the Netherlands from 1994 to 2002 and the leader of the Dutch Labour Party from 1986. Um, he's, since his time in office, been working in a variety of important uh, areas, including with the International Crisis Group and the International Commission on Missing Persons, and brings a wealth of experience on a range of these issues. We'll then hear from Prime Minister Zlatko uh, Lagumzia, did I get that right, more or less, <laughs> who was Prime Minister of Bosnia-Herzegovina for 2001 and 2002. Um, but before that, it served as his country's Deputy Prime Minister twice and as Minister of Foreign Affairs twice. Um, he was the President of the Social Democratic Party and also has been very active out of office, working, for example, in election monitoring in such places as Iraq um, and Pakistan and in other places. Um, We'll then hear from two uh, representatives from Oxfam, from Catherine Trevick, who is the director of uh, senior researcher um, working on the Ox mission, the organization's uh, research and um, planning um, work, and also from Sally Copley, who runs the UK uh, policy office of the organization. And why these people? Well, the Club de Madrid thought very hard about the issues before us today, this idea of big picture questions of social inclusion and environmental sustainability, and convened a working group to try to make some progress on this. The working group met, uh, Catherine was on the working group, met several times and produced a report, which you can find on the internet, called uh, Sharing Our Planet Today and Tomorrow, which brings together some key insights. Um, we're going to hear about that work and specifically how we can take it forward. So without further ado, Prime Minister, may I turn to you to help us under enter this very important set of issues. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I first want to thank the Vavatic uh, School of Government for hosting us today. They are experts on government and governance, and uh, we are looking forward to their help today in exploring the government governance challenges in implementing uh, Agenda 2030. Um, the Sustainable Development Goals, you all know, um, uh, provide a framework for development and a clear set of goals and targets that are achievable. This is a large, complex and ambitious plan and the concept of such a plan is an important mechanism for energizing and coordinating the efforts to realize the future we want for all, as the UN System Task Team said near the beginning of this process. The issues uh, uh, are probably shared, uh, positive views on the, on the SDGs and the importance uh, shared by everyone. And uh, so let me say a bit about the Club of Madrid and the way we are engaged in these sort of problems. Uh, the Club of Madrid has already briefly been introduced by the moderator. Uh, we are basically uh, committed to democracy, a democracy that delivers, as we say, but has also been engaged with many issues that include climate change, access to energy, inequality, social justice, 
uh, terrorism and violent extremism, uh, women's leadership, etc., etc. One particular issue that we have been engaged with uh, consistently for more than 10 years is the problem or the set of problems related to social division and social exclusion of identity groups. And this is one of the most important issues of our day. This is not only because it's eth ethically wrong to marginalize people on grounds of race, color, religion, gender, and uh, etc., but we have seen that it leads to tensions and conflicts, often across borders, and it's very wasteful of resources and holds back development. So we established um, the Shared Societies Project uh, 10 years ago now to promote a more holistic view of what is required to overcome social exclusion and marginalization of people because of their identity and background. Social exclusion is the condition that needed to be changed, but we wanted to focus on the positive by adopting this term. And I know that the term shared societies is, uh, has acquired some currency in the UK as well, with your Prime Minister, for example, using it fairly often. Uh, however, not everyone uses the term as we use it. Uh, a shared society is one where everyone can play their full part, gain their full benefits, and is able to share responsibility for the welfare and well-being of the whole community. So we are not only talking about overcoming poverty and inequality, though they are important, very important dimensions. We are talking about ways to ensure everyone has dignity and respect that everyone can express uh, themselves and their identity as long as it does not interfere with others, that everyone feels at home and that they belong and are accepted. And we have not just described a shared society, but looked at why it needs to be at the center of all our efforts to tackle any of the issues that are of concern. And it's clear that uh, when people are involved in the decisions that affect them, and feel able to share responsibility for the development of their community and society, then efforts to bring about positive change will be more effective and people themselves will feel more fulfilled. So we responded very positively to the concept of sustainable development for many reasons. Uh, one is uh, that uh, such a concept helps to achieve our goal of a shared society, but also the more we can achieve a shared society at local, national, uh, regional, or indeed global level, the more we are creating the best conditions to pursue the SDGs. So the uh, Shared Societies Project tracked the post-2015 process on behalf of the Club of Madrid as a whole. And we were keen that the goals were seen as interdependent, so that progress on one would benefit progress on other. Um, as the moderator said, we, uh, I was Prime Minister of the Netherlands in uh, 2000. That's the year where we decided on the Millennium uh, Development Goals. And uh, the major, one of the major differences between, between these Millennium Goals and the nowadays uh, SDGs is that these Development Goals then were much more seen as a series of standalone goals which meant that there could be good, good progress on uh, individual goals and others were lagging behind. And we learned our lesson, or the leaders or the, the countries have learned their lesson, and the UN has learned the lesson, and has become, uh, has made uh, this set of SDGs much more interrelated and interdependent. And we are keen that the goals should be inclusive and participatory. I've already noted that when people are involved the uh, uh, development, uh, their efforts will be much more uh, effective and it's likely that better solutions will be found if all stakeholders work together in genuine partnership. Uh, we were keen that the goals are universal, applicable to all st states and that there should be recognition that even the most developed states have part to play in rooting out areas of underdevelopment in their own population and supporting efforts to bring about development in other states. If the drafting of 2030, the agenda, was a big challenge, achieving the goals is an ambitious undertaking and the members of the Club of Madrid stand ready to support where possible and necessary at the national level and internationally. 
We have no hidden agenda. We are just available. And uh, we are now already almost two and a half years into the process of the SDGs, so which means we have only 12 and a half years to complete the process, and will we succeed? Uh, the UN, of course, is the source of uh, Agenda 2030 and takes the lead in the implementation processes. And we have supported the role of the UN high-level political forum at which individual member states, uh, individual states submit voluntary uh, national reviews. And we are pleased to see that uh, so many steps have already come forward, but this will be most useful if member states share their problems and concerns and bottlenecks as well as their achievements. It's very natural when you're in office. I know that myself, when you have to report to some uh, supranational body, maybe the EU or the UN, you are always uh, inclined to, uh, to emphasize uh, the, uh, the positives and to be a bit silent about uh, the negatives or the, 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 uh, uh, the, 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 the fields where you are somewhat lagging behind. And for this process, it will be very important, of course, to have frank and full reports by governments about uh, the things that go well and the things that up to so far don't go, don't go that well. Uh, there are some disappointments. Uh, I uh, come close to, to, uh, to, uh, to ending my, my introduction. Uh, one uh, disappointment is that the Addis Ababa agenda on financing for development uh, back in 2015 fell short of what, what was required, and that's important. Uh, and especially at the same time, you see uh, witnessing, we are witnessing trends towards uh, isolationism, which could set back the achievement of the goals and targets. And uh, environmental sustainability is a specific focus on some of the uh, goals and is also a necessary condition for the achievement of all the goals. And international cooperation has again fallen short. Experts tell us that the uh, ambitious Paris Agreement, for example, is not sufficient even. Even the Paris Agreement might be not sufficient to hold global warming. And some countries have now withdrawn. Uh, however, there are grounds of hope as well. The withdrawal of the United States from the Paris Agreement was followed by renewed commitments from other stakeholders, including the business sector and municipality, also in the U.S., and I think the role of municipalities, the role of cities is key. Many of the solutions uh, must be found at the local level, and it is at the local level that the challenges are often felt most keenly. All the stakeholders are physically close together within the city, and coalitions can more easily be established between citizens' groups and civil society, politicians, the business community, trade unions, religious leaders, and so on. So cities are twining across continents, raising awareness of the challenges in other places. And we produced a small publication on local governments for shared societies. Uh, it can be found on our, our website. And all these efforts need an enabling environment, of course. And states across the world can provide that environment if they understand each other and their needs and work out ways to cooperate. And we in the Club of Madrid hope to contribute to that sense of shared responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. I think the, the key insight that these global issues you know, reach down to the very ground where people live and work and think about not big things like the SDGs every day, but think about the parochial concerns of jobs and health and children and education is exactly the bridge we're trying to build here. So I'm sure we'll have a discussion on that in the, uh, the question period. Prime Minister Laguznia, may I turn to you next um, to tell us how you see these issues unfolding? Well, first of all, I want to thank all of you to sharing our int interest in the same topic that we do uh, think it's one of the topics that the people in the future will be more and more, I won't say obsessed with, but aware of, and be ready to think about it, to do something about it. First, I want to thank uh, to you, Catherine, because, I mean, Cathy was the one who actually we commissioned to prepare us first preparatory paper for the working group that I was sharing with my dear friend and colleague, Laura Chinchilla, a uh, member of the Club de Madrid, and Catherine made extraordinary work in the very beginning of our meetings uh, with, uh, let's say, uh, giving us more awareness of what we were actually tackling. 
then of course, Tom, I have to thank you because in the end you made a great paper that our analysis and our recommendations uh, were in a very short paper that I'm sure some of your, some of your students and colleagues are aware of uh, were giving a very precise uh, roadmap what we should do and what should be done in order to this analysis and this topic that we're talking about can be turned into the action and actually to be turned online. But first I want to give the longest part of my speech. I want to answer to the question that is given as a topic. Can we build social inclusive and environmentally sustainable societies? That's the question. Mm -hmm. And I'll give the most comprehensive answer. And of course it will require much, much more time than I have available, but I'll do it in full size, full scale. Yes. <laughs> okay? Now, I want to talk about so much how we can do it, who can do it, what can be done, and what are the players in that field. There are a lot of things that you can find in our papers that we are referring to. But I will just share a few thoughts with you about why I'm so confident the answer is yes. Because, and I want to share some thoughts about why the answer is yes. The answer is yes because of a very simple reason. First reason is because we have no alternative but to do it. That's the first reason. And I mean, when you are, uh, we burned all bridges behind us. If we don't come to this goal, uh, which is titled as a socially inclusive and environmentally sustainable society, we have no future. And we can very clearly explain. But to mobilize people to, to, to do something, we have to be aware of that. We have to create a sense of urgency. We have to mobilize as many people as possible and try to find some kind of logical network of the people who are ready to do something regardless of what they do in their lives. Because this is such a huge goal that we, no one, our goal is that no one is left behind. But in order to achieve that goal, no one should be behind in working something on that goal. There are no big players or small players. They're just players who are ready to participate and players who can do it. The reason why I'm so confident in it uh, of course, as I said, there we had no alternative. And the second reason, my optimism is very much related to my experience. And my experience is very simple. Pessimism cannot deliver anything. Even if you have reason to be pessimistic, you probably switch the, switch the line. Because if you don't switch the line, you have no chance at all. Uh, so that's the reason why we have to be optimistic about it, among other things. But also, because we have enough knowledge, if not technology, enough power in the sense of economy, in the sense of people, to do something. Today, we live in a world that is completely different than the world when I joined political life. I joined political life back in when I was on my postdoctoral Fulbright scholarship, teaching kids and preparing my book for my textbook for my students in computer science back in Bosnia, and I was doing that in the USA. I was never, never before thinking about politics. I was never involved in politics before. But then I saw Berlin Wall falling down, and I realized that those bricks are going to hit me in Sarajevo very soon. So I went back to my city to try to prevent that those bricks hit us hard, that we somehow survive. Now, since that time, today when you took all statistics, which you're very familiar with, most of you better than I do, uh, today the globe is producing four times more wealth annually than at that time. We are three times more powerful when you took analysis about the size and speed and power of technology. If you're a computer scientist or related to computers, you can find out, uh, looking for the Moore's law, that today we are 300 times more powerful from that side than at that time. When you look at the countries that live in democracy, there are two times more people living in democracy than 30 years ago. But the world is obviously in a mess at the same time. So this mess is the mess that is related with segregated societies and isolationism, isolationism hitting on every political agenda in every country. Segregated society versus shared society. And today's battles are no more about left and right so much, but about who is promoting inclusion, who is promoting exclusion. Who is promoting shared society, who is promoting segregated society. Who wants to bring the walls, who wants to bring the bridges. Second thing is economy. Economy is sustainable development. Sustainable development, overall development, led us to do something which we call inequality. Now, the bad part is my, my favorite. I mean, since I met Catherine, I, I got in love with Oxfam reports. Uh, and, uh, you know, nine years ago, uh, when 
Obama walked into the White House on hope. In your report, there were 159 Americans having as much wealth as bottom half of poorest America. That was nine years ago. Eight years later, last year, when we were in the middle of our report preparatory things, you gave us a report in which we saw when the blonde guy was walking into the White House, they printed a report in which said that eight Americans have as much wealth as the half of America. A year later, your last report says, which I read this morning very, very enthusiastically, three, three persons in the United States have as much wealth as half of America. So inequality about economic inequality is not the only inequality. We are, we are approaching very more dangerous inequality, which is technological inequality. That is going to be re related with the growth of interconnectivity and artificial intelligence, with something which is called singularity and whatever the topic is. We are going to be uh, confronted with social inequality, which is actually talking about inclusion and exclusion. We are talking about educational inequality. We are talking about ignorance and knowledge on one side. And we are talking, finally, about legal inequality, injustice or justice. So those are all types, and I can have you believe me longer list. I have seven of them, but for the introductory purpose, I won't use all of them. And my last point, we try to make something which we call new paradigm. The question is how to put together holistically, how to have a big picture in which we are looking what do we want to achieve. We think that we, there is a time to holistically approach and hit the problems of society or people, economy or production and profit, and environment or our planet. So the, there's some kind of cohabitation in between people, planet, and production is urgently needed, especially because we live in a cloud of knowledge, in a cloud of interconnectivity, in a cloud of new technologies with a something that we have to put the fundament on below all those things, which are our values. And we come back to square one, values. So the question is, who is going, whose values are going to be dominant values in a world in front of us? I strongly believe that if our values do not prevail, then their values will not prevail because their values are leading us to the end of all of us. So that's the reason why I think that we have to create some kind of great coalition of everyone that is sharing this. And last point, we had a lunch uh, today, five of us, and uh, I made one test, very interesting test. <laughs> uh, there were five of us, six of us at lunch, and I asked something which a friend of mine asked me a few, few weeks ago. His son is about high school. He lives in one country, irrelevant of the country. He's very educated, very knowledgeable, diplomat, entrepreneur, state, everything was behind him. And he was worried about his son, what to do with his son. And I told him, look, since your, fa your father is passing the property to your son, I mean, would you, if you would sell that property and send your son someplace, buy him a house and buy him a good scholarship to start a new life, could you name the country in which you would like to send him? Be sure that in 20 or 30 years, your son is not going to ask his son, where do you want to go? My friend was very, very shocked with that question, and he realized that he has no clue where to send his son. The only way to do it is make his country better and make our world planet better and make us all better. When we asked, when I asked five of us, six of us, I didn't give an answer. I asked my five colleagues, some of them are in here. They named five different countries from two different continents. It wasn't so easy. <coughs> from two different continents. Where would you like to be and be living with the normal people, with the people who share your values, with your education, with your economy being having some kind of prosperity, with your planet and your environment being some kind of friendly? Where would you go? So I'll go for that answer. The best answer is try to make where you are your home but be all over the planet and try to make planet your home as well. How to do it, who will do it, we will do it, how to do it. We will see how to do it, but we know that we have to have final answer. Why we should do it, because we have no alternative. 
and after all, it's better to make the world like we think that should be than what they think that they would like to have the world for themselves only. Yeah. Thank you, Prime Minister. This is a very important thought experiment. Where would you be but, but here on this planet that we all share and inevitably have to share and so might as well make worth living on? Catherine, you have been helping frame these thoughts um, through, the, through the report and, of course, in your work. So what should we be focusing on? So I want to thank Tom for, for having us here. Oh, that's my mic. Can you still hear me okay? Still turning? Okay, I'll ignore it. And thanks all of you for coming out on a beautiful Thursday evening. And, and particularly want to thank Club de Madrid um, for having me be part of the, this process because it was quite an extraordinary experience for me. Um, I, I haven't told you this, Clem, but uh, I have a confession that I, I went to the first meeting of this group and I expected to be a bit of an outlier. I, I expected to talk about how we need to fundamentally change our economic system and feel a little bit on the margins of that conversation. Or if there were people around in the working group who agreed with me, I expected the caveat, well, this is just my personal view. But what was quite extraordinary, and we had a very diverse group of members of this working group, and you can see who they are in, in the report, people from all over the world and from all sorts of different institutions and backgrounds, they were pretty united in the extent to which they called out the economic system as the culprit for so many of the challenges that our world is facing. And, and if you leaf through the report, you'll see that they, there are very few punches pulled. We talk about the extent to which this economic model is ill-equipped for serving the purpose of delivering greater well-being, delivering sustainability, and let alone delivering on the ambitions of, of the SDGs. We, we, we say this Agenda 2030, this beautiful goal of leave no one behind, has no chance of succeeding if we do not fundamentally change how our economic systems are working. We point to the warnings that we're hearing from scientists around the world that we're coming up towards the, the sixth mass extinction. And we see that as one of the greatest automations that humanity can face. I mean, it's terrifying, absolutely terrifying. And the time is, is ticking away. And we also point to how so many of the policy choices uh, that, that our economic system hinges upon are based around wrong assumptions about human nature. So there's a pretty strong critique there. And then when it comes to setting out some of the changes that we think need to be brought in about. It's in that very complex systemic world of structural change. So yes, there are the policies that we pull down and, and examples that we give, but we, we really try to hold that, that complex and hence more challenging to get your head around and more challenging to find your intervention points. But that space where the economy needs to serve the purpose of the social and, and the environment and the interdependence of, of all of them. And it's almost about putting the economy back in its place as if it's designed the right way, meeting those greater purposes of human and ecological well-being, rather than the other way around, as we so often see at the moment. We talk about how we need to really account for the, in, the breadth of impact that economic activity has, rather than just seeing it in very narrow terms of the sort of short-term cost-benefit analysis. And we talk particularly about new, new measures of progress, uh, whether it's for firms to shift away from that short-term uh, shareholder-orientated profit maximization machine and actually understand the vast potential of businesses and enterprise to deliver a whole wide range of social and environmental benefits if they are geared up the right way, if profit is a vehicle rather than the destination in itself. And we talk about the need to go beyond GDP as a measure of progress for society, for countries, for, let alone for the economies. It's a pretty flawed measure of, of economies, let alone a proxy for how societies are doing. And, and so it's a really quite an exciting report in it, all its diversity uh, and, and all its critique, but it's, it's pretty powerful. And what makes it exciting for me is that this is the sort of things I write about a lot, but this is from, a, this is from Club de Madrid. 
<laughs> These are over 100 former heads of state saying this. These are people who've seen the challenges of policy making up close and it's personal and they, they are really setting out a challenge to all of us to make this happen. And, and when we talk about this idea of a, a grand coalition, one of the things I want to finish with is by reporting some progress that's happened since we published this, this report. And towards the end of the report, if you're looking, looking through it, you'll see there's a page there that talks about something called the We Seven, uh, the Wellbeing Economy Seven. And it's this idea that we need a new alliance of states and regions, of governments who are trying to pursue well-being economies who are not saying we're there yet, they're not claiming to be well-being economies, but they're saying we want to work together to try and create policy making to contribute to well-being economies. Now, I really like the idea of the We Seven, mainly that's because I'm, I'm based in Scotland, so I, the idea of <laughs> We has, has different, different meanings, but, but some people didn't. So we've moved on a bit, and it's a rather clunkier term, the, the group of well-being economy governments. And I'm really delighted to, to report that this project is, is moving on and we're working with countries, and this is the, the sort of countries that I responded to when we were asked this question at lunch, where, where would we want to be in 30 years? Leadership being shown by Scotland, by Costa Rica, by Slovenia. We're in conversations with Iceland, with Finland, with Rwanda, with New Zealand, with Sikkim, with Bhutan. And, and any ideas, any, any, any of you who want to get involved, do come and chat to me at the end. But what's exciting about this is that these are countries who are wanting to roll up their sleeves and work together to face these shared challenges, to collaborate, to exchange, mm. but also to say to the rest of the world, there's a different sort of development that the 21st century needs, and it's not about faster, faster GDP growth. That, that is not development. Because if you look at analysis of how countries are measuring up against the goals of the SDGs, the reports say no country is developed because no country has got there yet. So this idea of this new group of governments is saying if we can turn our sights on a different objective and work together for that, then we can set the dial differently. But we need to do it together because none of us are perfect yet. But we want to go on this process, this journey of continuous improvement. And I'd be delighted to, to work with any of you who want to be part of that as well. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Catherine. I think that in example is particularly inspiring because it combines, if you want, the two poles that we're wrestling with here, this vision for where we know we need to get to. As um, the Prime Minister said, we must make these choices, we must make these changes, but they're radical, they're transformative, they're different, a different world that's trying to be created. So how can we possibly make that practical, applied? And here's a really interesting example of governments trying to figure out that very, very basic reorientation you're trying to um, promote. So before we turn to Sally for your reflections and, and thoughts on this uh, comment, this actually is a good opportunity for me to interject my own small thoughts on, um, on that exact question of how we make this real. Because as um, was mentioned, I um, took the report that was written and um, found it very inspiring and a beautiful vision with lots of different ideas about how we can make this world uh, come together. And I was given the very difficult job that our students here at the Bologna School will probably be familiar with of how to make that happen. What are some ideas for actually implementing this into various policies? And it might seem like an impossible task, right? We have to convince governments and companies and cities and businesses all around the world to change everything about what they do. How are we possibly going to do that? But actually, we came up with a huge list of very specific concrete things that can be done. I'm not going to go, don't worry, I'm not going to bore you with all of them now, but please do look at the paper if you're interested. Things like shifting subsidies from uh, things we don't want to do to things we do want to do. So shifting subsidies from fossil fuels to uh, aid to the poor, to green economy. Things like trying to create the basic institutional conditions for um, inclusion, such as rule of law, human rights, democracy, things that we know are correlated with positive outcomes on social indicators and also environmental indicators. Um, important things that um, the Prime Minister mentioned is about changes in global governance. We don't just think about this as a job of states, talking to other states in, in rooms far away from where people actually work and live and operate, but actually in cities. So cities getting involved in the Paris Agreement, cities getting involved in all sorts of global issues. These are the kinds of changes that are happening, but ones that we, all of us, need to work on much more. And so the vision that the Club of Madrid is taking forward is not I think it's important to say some sort of abstract um, wish list that even though we must do, we don't know how to do, we know a lot about what to do. Um, and this is a question of making it happen again and again in place after place on issue after issue. So um, it's not a guarantee we'll do it, but at least there's just something we can occupy our, our time with productively. Sally, you occupy your, your, your time very productively in a very um, <laughs> set of important work looking at Oxfam's role in policymaking in this country and of course internationally. 
how do you interpret these issues? What reactions do you have to the report, to the work, uh, vision here, to the strategies for taking it forward, and what can we do to make these goals come about? That's a, not a small question. Thank you. Um, I wanted to start by saying thank you for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Also, it's such a fabulous discussion to be part of. It really is fascinating. Um, I, I may well be uh, ahead of policy with Oxfam, but I actually tend to think in pictures. So th this is my picture <laughs> that I brought for you. Um, the, I'm in violent agreement with everything that you're saying. I think Oxfam is in violent agreement with everything that you're saying. It makes complete sense. Um, and at Oxfam, we don't do anything unless it's pretty much impossible. If it, if it looks really difficult, like no one's ever going to achieve it, we'll, we'll give it a go. We're in. Um, if it looks a bit easy, maybe, maybe not for us. Um, and I say that arrogantly, and I mean it. We're, this is about huge structural change. That is what Oxfam is all about, and I'm really very proud of that. Um, but what, the reason I draw these circles is when I was reading the report, and in fact listening to you now, I've, I've been writing over my picture. I used to work for an agency based in the UK. Um, it's changed names a few, na a few times now. It's called the Young Women's Trust. But we used to do youth work at a local level with disadvantaged young women. Um, and we worked with young mums, pregnant teenagers, with girls who felt that there was their route uh, through life would be to, um, if they were lucky, get an apprenticeship um, in a salon um, and maybe one day be able to do some hairdressing. They, there's nothing wrong with being a hairdresser, but being a, in the beauty industry in the UK is the lowest paid sector you can go into. Um, it is overwhelming. It's 99% female in the apprenticeship sector. Going into construction is the highest paid sector you can go into in apprenticeships, and that has um, exactly the counter. It's 99% male. So we wanted to really challenge how young women who had their whole lives ahead of them were making decisions. We built on the provision that we had at a local level. We had a fantastic centre in Doncaster where it was an open, it was a young women's centre. Girls used to come in for all sorts of things. They used to come in to do henna painting or to do cookery or IT lessons. But actually creating a safe space for young women to really challenge the norms, what the system was telling them, enabled us to build something that was much more powerful than that. Um, we worked with young women so that they were actually able to sit on panels alongside Conservative and Labour and Liberal Democrat MPs at party conferences, and in fact to be able to lean over and to tell the minister sat next to them that actually he doesn't know what he's talking about, which is a wonderful thing and something that I would never say, and I certainly don't think of you. <laughs> but I think having... Being, the reason I mentioned that story to begin with is, and my model, I will tell you what my, what my picture is. This, is. this is what my colleague used to refer to as the three eyes of oppression. It's not very technical. You start at the middle. How we experience what society um, and what culture around us tells us, how we internalise that. That's the first eye. The second is how that affects our interpersonal relationships between you and me. You know, what, what, how does that affect my relationship if I'm a young mum getting on the bus with a pushchair and feeling the judgment of people around me or not actually being able to afford the fare? And then the third eye is the institutional. So how does that feel when I'm interacting with the education services, with the social services, with the health services that I need to help me and my baby to make the best future I can for my baby? I think this is really relevant for this discussion because... And in fact, listening to you even more so, I felt it when I read the report, but listening even more so, the challenge I think for us is what practically we can do to really bridge those gaps. Because we might not all be internalising oppression, but we're all internalising everything that we're doing in terms of the economic system, the, the, the social systems around us. You know, my thought processes today is, is, is how can I be a better mum? You know, how can I make more time to be a better mum? Why, why, when my son sends me a WhatsApp telling me that uh, uh, John Wick is now on Fortnite, that means something to me. That's ridiculous. You know, how, how, why, why do I always cycle late and arrive looking like a drowned rat? Or why did I not know it's my dad's birthday today and not tomorrow? Everybody's got all... We've already got so much going in our heads already. The question is, how do we get into that space that we're occupying in ourselves, trying to keep our own lives as we want them to be and for those around us? I think there are routes that we can offer, and I've been really struck 
by my fellow panellists talking about shared societies, building those genuine partnerships, that the solutions must be at a local level. And we do have segregated societies. And there are routes that Oxfam offers. I've, I, I mentioned the work at um, the Young Women's Charity I worked at. At Oxfam, I've seen amazing work in the northern provinces of uh, northwest provinces, sorry, of Bangladesh, working with Women's Cooperative, um, or working in Kenya with market traders, really challenging the tax collectors to actually do something with the taxes they're collecting. Or even in Manchester, where our women's rights director and I visited work last year and met women who, through, through no fault of their own, have found themselves in a position of powerlessness, but actually with just a little bit of support, are actually able to stand up and tell their story, to go for job interviews, to get the job, and then to leave and find work. Really empowering stuff, and it happens at a very local level. And we can make those links between the internal, the interpersonal, and the institutional but I think the, the, the real challenge for us is how we motivate people to do that. And I, I've held three things, and I'll finish on this. I've had three things for a while now. I'm, I'm a public-facing campaigner with Oxfam. My background is working in campaigns, and it is about making a difference. I think to actually really translate and communicate why this matters, I hold them to three things. The first is emotion. So, so can we build a connection? Can we demonstrate why it matters? Can, can I make you care? about what happens to somebody, whether it's in Manchester or in Nairobi. The second is around impact. We're talking about structural change, massive goals. So important, absolutely the right place where we can be, but demonstrating impact, that's quite hard. I mean, it's, this year it's 100 years since women got the vote in the UK. Internationally, there is only one country where 50-50 decision makers or elected members of parliament, sorry, are male, female. Only one nation in the world and... I haven't got a prize to give for the person who can name that nation, but I would be impressed. Um, I didn't know until last week. Um, but there's only one nation. But you know what? We did get a, a global arms trade treaty a couple of years ago. Change really is possible. But getting the steps along the way, that's a hard thing. And that's one of the things I'm keen for us to demonstrate. But the third thing that I've always held in my public campaigning and which have been really minded of the panel is honesty. One of the things that I think is hardest um, is for institutions to admit when they've got something wrong. I'm obviously speaking from real experience about this, but I think it's always hard to create a society where we can admit that there's been a fault, where we can admit we can do things better. And that's part of really creating these shared societies and that shared humanity, is being able to have the emotion, being able to demonstrate the impact, and then being able to be honest. Thank you, Sally. I think your comments really bring home for me the, um, an important point about this, bringing this idea of these very abstract goals at the global level into actually our personal lives and our own conception of self in some way. Um, and also that this is not an issue that um, sustainable development, these ideas we're talking about are not something that uh, live in the kind of charity box that we can mm -hmm. safely put in our donation and forget about it. This is something that's tearing apart our society, every society, our personal lives. We wake up in the night thinking about um, why our societies aren't more inclusive. Mm -hmm. These divisions um, are very, very real to us and maybe in a way they haven't. And that's obviously very scary, but if there's a silver lining is through that personal connection with mm -hmm. this a shared society might be more possible to, to bring about. So in the spirit of shared society, we'd like to share the conversation with everyone here in the room um, and bring in some questions and comments and feedback. And we'd request that you wait for a microphone to arrive before you begin your comments just so the people listening online can hear us. Um, and please introduce yourself briefly before you begin so we can see where you're coming from. Um, but who would like to start us off? Gentlemen here, please. Hello, my name's Roger. Um, quite nervous. Sorry, oh, sorry, Thank you. Uh, quite nervous about doing the public speaking thing. Um, you see many examples of organisations and governments trying to tackle this problem, and they do it in many ways. They can, you know, make laws, uh, use the education system, um, experts. But the one thing that seems to be missing is the aspect of emotional intelligence, because the academic intelligence is, I mean, you know, we spend billions on academic intelligence and, you know, this place um, is a, a, a great example. But we don't, we seem to ignore the emotional intelligence side. Now, what you read online puts it as more important than academic. Um, you know, academia is something man-made, whereas the emotional intelligence goes way back, um, you know, before we could read and write. But it always seems to be forgotten about. And surely if um, the, our emotional intelligence was improved, then 
a, a lot of the problems that we're facing would almost sort of dissolve. Mm -hmm. um, Roger, I wonder if you guys give us a very short example of where you see that problem existing or, or conversely, an example of where you see someone actually, a government or a public official, having emotional intelligence, just so we have a clear sense. Uh, well, I mean, there was a class, it, it's maybe not quite um, what you're asking, but mm -hmm. there was a news article, there was, um, it was on about uh, one of the wars that was going on, I can't even remember where it was, and they were interviewing a guy, um, he was walking out of a war-torn environment, and the, the reporter asked him how he felt, what he was going to do. And his answer was, I'm going to kill. I'm going to wreak revenge. Um, and <clears throat> you sort of think, well, based on what is emotional intelligence, that's, mm. th even though, you, you know, many people say, oh, I can't blame the guy. You know, he's probably lost his family. Mm. But that's not using emotional intelligence. Now, another example was the guy, and I can't remember his name. You know, the the guy that drove the van into the, um, the people in London, he mm -hmm. uh, was an English chap. Um, somebody stopped, the, the, the people that um, were affected, mm -hmm. they were about to reap revenge. And one guy stepped in and he went, no. Now you can imagine that um, in that scenario, the tensions were just as high, mm -hmm. um, but one guy went, no. Now, mm -hmm. the guy that turned around and said, I'm gonna you know, reap revenge, he doesn't solve anything. Yeah. He just perpetuates the problem. Yeah. Um, whereas the guy that stopped, the, you know, the people wreaking revenge in, um, when that uh, van hit those people, he stopped something happening again. Right. Now that's hard yeah. to do. And that's a question we all need to think about for a billion to or at the governmental level, right? To take from this, yes. very, that's a great example to help us think about how to take that spirit and bring it into policy. Yeah, yeah I, I think right. the spirit, it's, it's more because, I mean, it, it is an intelligence. Yeah, and then emotional intelligence, exactly. Yeah. Great, let's collect a few uh, additional comments and then turn back to the panel for some responses. Thank you, Roger. Thanks very much. I'm Emmanuel, um, a Master of Public Policy student here at the Blavang School. Um, thank you very much for the um, rich insights you've all shared. Um, one, one of the, the resounding themes from, from the conversation has been that, that the economic system has failed us. Um, I differ slightly um, in that um, you know, um, over the last few decades, um, the global economic system has developed value for us, has, has delivered value for you know, countries like mine, Nigeria, developing countries where people have, lots of people have you know, grown, been lifted from poverty and been moved into the middle class. You know, talking about technology, talking about um, innovative products and services around the world. Uh, but one of the things that I see that that even strengthens the economic system, or that strengthens the argument that you know the economic system is really maybe not the problem, is that we've got um, binding rules of of economics all around the world. We've got sanctions that that enable countries to actually um, do what is right. Um, but when it comes to environmental and social sustainability, what we find is that we've got rules, we've got standards, global codes of um, you know, practice that are not binding on nation states. And that's why you find countries also pulling out of these um, agreements. Mm -hmm. um, are there ways we could move from non-binding soft laws into you know, you know, stronger, stronger um, rules of engagement when it comes to sustainable development? So we don't just have parties pulling out but um, such that we could also maybe enforce some sort of sanctions that could get countries to act better. If we know that these are serious problems, that um, you know, um, carbon emissions are, are bad for the world, just as much as bribery and corruption are bad for the world, can we have stronger rules around these matters? How do we move from you know, soft laws into stronger? Um, yeah. Great, a great question. So how do we make stronger rules for things we want to create and maybe less strong rules for things we want to avoid? Um, last question, then we'll turn back to the panel from Maria, please. Hello, um, I'm a research fellow here at Devlab Admin. Um, in order to build a socially inclusive and environmental sustainable society, of course, includes many different Sorry, actors. Maria, I think it's just a little bit soft. If you hold it close, oh. that'd be great. Uh, we need many need, uh, different actors, but we also uh, need th the interest of those different actors to converge. And sometimes the state interests are different from the economic interests of private companies, and civil society interests could be different too. So I wonder if you could comment on how to solve that tension. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
so we need lots of voices, but they may not agree. So how do we get them into a shared society? Um, who would like to start us off? Could I turn to you, Prime Minister Cox, just to start us in the same order? Would you, Do you want me to start? If you don't mind starting, that'd be fantastic. <clears throat> yes. Um, well, uh, I think it, it, emotion should play a long, stronger role, especially also when you talk about environmental um, issues. And, and this is going on, I think. Uh, uh, people are much more aware, emotionally aware, of the fact that, that, that we reach the end of, um, of, uh, 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 of a long era where we could really uh, uh, continue using the planet or misusing the planet uh, the way we are doing it now. Um, and this brings about a lot of emotion. And of course, this is fragmented quite often. Uh, uh, not always that articulated, but people are emotionally much more, and perhaps that this should further be be uh, encouraged and 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 supported and facilitated to to, uh, to make make it clear that this is not not just something technical, but that really the, the end of, of of the planet is in sight. Uh, let me say one one other one other remark. I. Um, I'm not as optimistic as my colleague is, but, but I, I, I'm, I'm close to him. Uh, and where, where, lies, where lie the, my major hesitation to fully agree? Uh, I, 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 I agree that, that um, pessimism doesn't help, but realism is sometimes necessary. Um, three things. Where is the political will? It is not just the will expressed by politicians, but uh, basically where is the will, the real will, to push aside egoism and say uh, we, um, we express complete solidarity with each other. Internationally, well, the way in which uh, uh, developed economies, uh, nations are prepared to give financial support to uh, less developed countries to meet, to be able to meet the environmental challenges, doesn't, doesn't make me very optimistic. At the national level, and at the regional level, you see the increasing increasing income and wealth gap. So radical changes in behavior are necessary. And my experience with change and reform in the past decades in power, political power and afterwards, has been that people like to talk about change and the necessity of change but are less, less, less uh, positive about accepting change that uh, has a negative impact on their own lives. And it may be different uh, in, uh, in this country, uh, but at least it was in my country uh, and in my part of the world uh, a pretty, a pretty uh, uh, and what is now at stake is we need a different way of thinking and, 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 and approaching, but um, uh, um, vested interests, and not only by, by a small, very rich elite, but also vested interests of, uh, of uh, well, average people, may be a bare necessity in order to meet all the conditions that have to be met to, in order to uh, reach really sustainable goals. Um, so I think the, the challenge is for all of us to find the words and methods in order to bring together the various stakeholders in a society uh, and try and find the language and the instruments 
in order to uh, unite them because these vested interests uh, lead uh, quite often also to different approaches. And I think two elements are important there. Self-interest, enlightened self-interest uh, has been in the past decades also a source of inspiration why people were prepared to help others because uh, because uh, the upper class, the uh, financial and economic elite or political elite uh, understood that in a world where differences and also income uh, differences are getting too uh, large, uh, there will not be a sense of togetherness and that can really really uh, uh, lead to radicalism that is that is uh, uh, that is not uh, not acceptable to everyone to anyone yeah. so self interest um, is important and 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 I feel that now and that that's the last comment I make um, that the self interest of i feel a kind of a kind of change the oxfam reports uh, especially the Oxfam reports uh, that are presented in the beginning of a year, uh, close to the start of the Davos uh, meetings in, uh, in, in Switzerland, um, are really having an impact. Many people who benefit directly or indirectly of uh, the growing inequality are coming to the conclusion that this cannot go on any longer because that will that will put society as a whole cohesion of society as a whole at stake uh, so i think we should think about ways and means in order to translate that into action and that's still uh, uh, a, a gap that has to be uh, filled yes a gap for policy entrepreneurs to fill hopefully some here in this room Mr. Lukovsky, how do you see these questions? Anything you want to pick up well, on? Uh, I don't know if it's better to say that I agree with women, say whatever I want to, or <laughs> to say I disagree and then say whatever I want to. Uh, but I <laughs> really strongly, I strongly <laughs> agree with him from one perspective about self-interest, and I, I completely agree with him. The self-interests are very, very strong driving force. I also uh, have reason to be pessimistic, but as I said, and I want to be very clear about that. Uh, I'm not talking about my facts. My feelings, I will just use some facts in order not to be another man with opinion. Uh, there was one excellent study that I, two, three years ago, that I found out in a very credible journal and school that was making a correlation between uh, ability and attitude in major American companies in relation with success. It doesn't mean that you cannot be innate, incapable and then succeed. But what was, what was the importance of attitude, which I call optimism, and going forward, strongly, fiercely believing in it, and uh, ability. What is your capacity? How much you are? And for me, the results were surprisingly different than I expected. Seven to one is ability lost. So seven times more bigger impact made your attitude than your ability. That's point number one. So that's the reason why I believe in attitude. I strongly believe in attitude. I don't think that without capacity, without ability, you can do it simply because you want it. Of course, I can walk out and say, okay, I want to th one, jump three meters high, and that's my attitude. Of course, it doesn't work that way. But attitude is important, point number one. Point number two, there was a... Last year, a very good survey talking about a uh, very simple question, global survey, uh, asking people around the world, what do you expect that in uh, your children, in 20 years from now, will they live in better economic and social environment than yourself? And I was shocked when I saw that biggest pessimists are Europeans, uh, organized Europeans, European Union Europeans. Uh, 64 to, I have it here, to 28. 64 worse, 28 better. 
The second on a pessimistic list were Americans, 60 to 32. Then Middle East is comme ci, comme ça. And then it goes Latin America, optimism. 58 optimists, 35 pessimists. Africa, 56 optimists, 32 pessimists. And of course, uh, Asia and Pacific, the biggest level of optimism, 51, 24. So what I'm trying to say, it looks like people who are in a bigger mess, they're bigger optimists, maybe someone can say that. But basically speaking, I mean, uh, optimism can do a lot. Now, based, connecting your two questions, first and third one, about what to do, and I agree, self-interest is very, very big driving force. There are no doubts about it. But I think we have reason and we have data and analysis and arguments to say that it is in everyone's self-interest to save this planet by saving this planet as a whole and having shared society and have sustainable development because it is in everyone's interest. So from interest perspective, as a long time ago, one big thinker said that in this uh, spaceship Earth, we are all crew, no one is passenger. If that was the good thing to say 50 or 60 years ago, you can imagine how true that is, that it is today. And there's one great statement, statement who is known among a lot of things by saying that in politics there are no friends, there are only interests. I know, that's the truth. But I think we are entering into the time where we can, using that line, say we can show that it is in everyone's interest. And then in order to do so, uh, I mean, because we need emotional intelligence to be, because with technology, emotional intelligence, as is rightly said, is becoming even more present and more dominant because of the spread of technology. Because academic voice is now, of course, as strong as it should be and as strong as it could be, but uh, strong of all people is much stronger, voice of all people is much stronger thanks to technology, social networks, interconnectivity and everything. So in that context, I think that uh, we should see how we can connect people and mobilize people on uh, interests, their self-interest, and I'm absolutely sure that when what the topic is of our today topic is of self-interest of all of us. Yeah. That's point number one. And point number two, we should more preach how to find a common denominator among all of us, or at the most of us, about a certain set of values. So if we share the values, if we look what are the common denominator of values, we can see that our coalition is much bigger than our coalition of sharing certain interests. So, and in that context, go back to the, just to conclude with this, I think it is very, very important to understand that politicians are people are they just cheap politician, populists, or real statements? But most of them, and all of them, to a certain extent, more or less, they function more, not uh, after get, they get into office, because they have time to fulfill their promises, their plans, and uh, their projects, but because they are under daily pressure. And that pressure is going to be bigger and bigger and bigger. So, I mean, pressure is the key word, and social intelligence, emotional intelligence, real intelligence, academic intelligence can do a lot to make pressure. Mm. So we have to do pressure on decision makers. And if they feel pressure, if our <laughs> predecessors, if us, if our successors see bigger pressure, then they will have to prioritize their activities based on that pressure. That's the reason why I think that we have to use pressure you know, to sort out the problem of those that, that different interests. Mm. Put pressure, put pressure, and every voice counts mm. more than ever. Thank you. So, Catherine and Sally, can I quickly collect your thoughts on these for three very interesting questions before we take another round? Brilliant. So, unexpectedly, three really brilliant questions at a venue like this. And so, I'll just very, very quickly, to make time for more brilliant questions, um, mm. race through a couple of thoughts that they, they spring to mind. And, and Roger, your, your questions have got my mind absolutely churning. And, and where I've, I've come to think is really almost quite depressing <laughs> reflection that so many of our systems are almost geared up to quash emotional intelligence. And, and I mean, you just have to look at the way, if you, if you go to a supermarket, how you're, you know, just rush through, you don't have a chance to have a conversation with the person behind the counter, how 
in, in even in the caring sectors. We've got this sort of perverse obsession with, with productivity that takes away people's capacity to spend time with someone that they're, they, they're mandated to, to look after. And, and so often it's that time and compassion that will make a difference to that, that person's experience. And, and yet we've put this sort of blinkered notion of what delivery is that pushes them away from being able to even draw on their emotional intelligence and, and be good at that. And then, and then there's this a wonderful Canadian economist, Mark Anowski, who, when he looks at, at GDP, he says that in GDP terms, the hero is a chain-smoking terminal cancer patient who's going through an expensive divorce, who crashes his car on the way to his job as an arms dealer because he's texting while eating a takeaway hamburger. And, and now that person, all those activities will boost GDP. But the emotional intelligence inherent in so many of, of those activities is, is nigh on, on zero. And, and so it just, it's got me yeah, really reflecting on just how, how, how misaligned so many of our systems, whether it's the micro or the macro, are from enabling us to reach into that emotional intelligence and, and act accordingly. But I do think we are seeing pushback against that. You know, we, we are seeing the flourishing of models and, project and projects and businesses that are saying, actually, this is what matters. Uh, and so I take, I take heart in that because I see that every day. These, these extraordinary organizations and, and businesses who are, who are really redesigning what they're about to put that at the forefront. So, um, so that's maybe my sort of mixed, <laughs> mixed re re reflection. And Emmanuel, your, your point around um, sort of the, the economic system and growth and then the assumptions b behind that, I mean, I mind and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, is my understanding is that there's been growth in, in Nigeria recently, but at the same time of poverty, an increase in poverty. And, and so it just shows even the sort of growth that we've got is not working for those who need it most. It, it's not being targeted and directed at those who, who desperately need that, that, more growth, that positive growth. And so there are examples where we can look at where economies have been designed in a way where the benefits and the bounties are directed at those who need them. And one of the examples is places like Vietnam. Not perfect, but they have had relatively pro poor growth. And there's, there was research out last week that looked at the extent to which com uh, different countries, over 150 countries, are living below an environmental ceiling but also delivering on social needs. Now, no country does that, but Vietnam comes closest. Um, it's research by ecological economists at the University of Leeds. Uh, but in terms of the assumptions and the laws and sort of pivoting to, to your, the proactive part of your, your question, which I really liked, I think part of this solution has to be putting in, our, in fair sight some of these wider environmental impacts. There was a report out in 2015 from the IMF, of, of all people, and they tallied up a very broad definition of subsidy. So subsidy is a bit like an onion. It's not just the, ob the obvious sort of giving a, a grant, but it's also costs that third parties have to pay. So included in tight, um, cleaning up after pollution, it included paying uh, a third party, often local authorities or health systems, paying for the impact of health, the deleterious health impact of, of, of pollution and so on. And they were looking at, they tallied all that up for fossil fuel companies. And so in that broad definition of the term subsidy, they estimated that fossil fuel com companies are subsidized to the extent of $10 million a day, which is enormous. So until we start tallying that up and counting it in how we define success of these sorts of com uh, companies and that, you know, putting that into our assumptions, then we'll have, we'll have no chance. And Maria, your point, um, I think almost beautifully goes back to Zlatko's fi final point around the, these common denominators. Um, I, and I think it comes down to the short term and long term yeah. that these things are set up as, as trade-offs. Um, I was hearing for a wonderful small organization in Rio a couple of years ago, and there's this, people talk about this sort of the neo-extractivist model of the Brazilian economy at the moment, sort of really get all the petrol out and, and farm the, the Amazon and so on and get as much of that. And then often that's channeled back into some relatively successful social projects. And this particular organisation was saying they feel an outlier in the social justice sector because they are saying, hang on a minute, it's not okay to deliver on social justice agendas at the cost of the environment because these things are intricately interlinked. But they felt that some of their colleagues in the sector were happy 
to plunder the environment to deliver very important social justice objectives. And what we need to do, and it's something that we talk about in this report a little bit, is create those virtuous circles where you deliver one, you're also delivering the other. And that cre requires creative and, ex and holistic policy thinking, but I don't think it's beyond us. I mean, we're 2018, we've got all these technologies, all this energy, all, you know, minds of people like in this room. I mean, we've got to be able to do it. So, and so it's long-term, but it's also coming back, back to conceptions of fundamental human needs. And when you ask anyone, no matter where they are, whether they're in Rio or whether in that, that supermarket rushing through the, the tills, when you ask them what really matters, it is universally the same. And so if we come back to fundamental human needs, then we have a chance at bringing together those ag agendas. Great. I'm eager to collect some more questions, but I don't want to shortchange you, Sally, if you have some burning points to interject on any of these points. We should begin on the way around. Can I answer them all together? Sure. Do you mind? Which is just a thing. <clears throat> I think there are some parallels that sit across lots of different walks of life, whether it's at institutional or personal levels. So that could be that um, for those in powerful, whether it's in your own life or at work or institutionally. What, so looking at all of those things together and emotional intelligence, I think this point about lots of voices, but you said they, they might not agree. I, I think starting at that local level, really being able to demonstrate, I'm thinking about the spirit level, which um, factually was able to, able to demonstrate that actually inequality led to greater levels of unhappiness and equality led to greater levels of happiness. Um, so I think looking at different examples of where that's really been shown to it, where people have put that into action to actually challenge the system and our, our lives. So thinking whether it's from the Harlem children's zone or looking at living wage cities or in Wales where um, we're, we're working with the Welsh Assembly Government to help them become a nation of sanctuary. It's not just a city of sanctuary for refugees within Wales, but a nation of sanctuary. So building on those models. And then the third thing I'd do is be really demonstrating, um, in terms of the rules, um, evidence-based policy making. Because I think this point is, like you're, for sure, I know that not everybody agrees with us. I know that. You just have to spend a morning in my house with my children to know nobody agrees with me. Um, but actually, this point is about actually demonstrating that together doing this, trying these things, showing that they actually work, that evidence, that then builds the voice to actually make the change happen. Right. Really good. Let's take a few more questions before we have time. I see um, anyone on this side of the room? Okay, one, uh, two here, one in the middle, and one there, and then we'll come back. Hi, uh, my name's Matt. I work in uh, industry, actually. Um, it seems to me, uh, coming from a financial background, we're very short on quant quantitative measures um, of this type of thing, of all sorts of things in this area. And we need to develop and define more um, to measure success. Right. And then if we, if we had such measures, and we know this instinctively, that so many of these are getting worse, they're accelerating, getting worse more quickly. And there's anything that's accelerating, if you're going to slow an accelerating vehicle, you need to take your foot off the accelerator first, but you're still, you're still speeding along before you're going to get slower, and then you need to put the brakes on. You need to get, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And that's kind of disheartening to anyone who's trying to make a difference, because if, you, if you're trying to slow something down and then it's accelerating, it is going to get worse temporarily before it gets better. So I think that, that, that really dis make, can make people disheartened when they're trying to make a difference, and then people realize that, it's, that it is still getting worse. Mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to allocate your effort to, to know where, what, what best to do. So if, you're, if you were using 10 plastic bottles a week and now you're using six, you, you might feel happy with yourself, but it's, we're, still, we're still, in Zatko's words, going to be in a mess. Yeah, exactly. So how, quantitative measures and then how do we move at the speed and pace we need to do without causing too much friction, if you want, over here. Um, my name is Shruti. I'm an MBA student here. Um, firstly, thank you for your time and your thoughts. Um, Catherine, you had mentioned a point around, you know, business's role in addressing the, the challenge that we've been presented with. And, and in particular, you spoke about, you know, the transition from profit being uh, the end goal to profit being a vehicle to achieve social and environmental outcomes. So I'm curious to understand more how you think we can achieve the shift in mindset and behavior in business, and in particular, what role regulation and policy can play in achieving that. 
Great. So what role can we do in, in regulating business and bringing business into a productive force here? The one here, and then the gentleman there, and then we'll close for the next round. Thank you. Uh, Jean from School of uh, Geography and the Environment. Um, I have a question specific to Prime Minister who just gave a very great example about the inequality for wealth. So you said that 15 people uh, in the past to eight people to three people now, uh, three Americans that actually have the entire half of uh, America's uh, wealth. Um, I just want to know, uh, you know, what, what, how are we going to do about it, really? Uh, I mean, it, all uh, perhaps now in the future will be more technology driven. So a lot of technocrats will have much more wealth and power than a lot of our common people. So are we going to tax them? You know, if we're in a spaceship of, of the Earth and we have the common share value of, of preserving the Earth, are we going to say that well, let's just tax them so that we can use those money for socially and uh, environmentally uh, impactful projects? Or what, what other ways can we actually do something about it? Because uh, it sounds scary, but as an optimist, uh, what would you say? Yeah, a very important question, and it also relates to Emmanuel's earlier question of a global economy of how taxation can work in a, in a world of 190 countries which have different rules about these things. So it's important to consider. And so I know some thoughts on that. Last question, please. Okay. <clears throat> My name is uh, David McDonald. I'm from the WILD crew. That's the Wildlife okay. Conservation Research Unit. It seems to me we've heard a lot of vivid insight <clears throat> about social inclusivity, what it might look like, and how we might approach achieving it. But my impression is we've heard rather less about what the sustained environment might look like, and particularly the biodiversity that is the moving parts of it, and how we might achieve that. I'd be interested in your reflections on that part of the question. Wonderful. So the other half of the coin environment and biodiversity in particular. Great, let's, um, let me collect the questions in the reverse order from last time. So, Sally, could I, uh, we'll start with those four, and then we'll, we'll, I think we'll have to, unfortunately, wrap up very quickly. But Sally, your thoughts, please. Okay, I'm going to limit myself to one question, yes. um, which is one that I bagged from Catherine. Um, so, thank you for the question around, uh, which came from over here, around inequality. Um, and what we do about it is over there, wasn't it? Um, we, I, I think there are lots of things we do about it. Um, and we, I, I'm really delighted to hear um, the feedback around uh, our reports every year for Davos that we put forward, because we do that and we have been doing it for a number of years to raise the profile. Without question, um, there are great steps that have been made in reducing poverty globally, but they're not as big as they could have been made had we actually been tackling inequality. Um, and with inequality rising, that is really damaging um, for those efforts. So there's a few things that I would point you in the direction of. One is absolutely around tax, um, and there are a number of things we can do around that. One of them is being transparent about where taxes are collected. The other is walking the talk. So when our, um, in this country, when the UK government says uh, tax dodging really matters, that then means following it up with action to actually be holding our, our crown dependencies and overseas territories to account. The, the, there's... I'm definitely not an economist or an accountant, so I won't go into more details, but there's lots we could be doing around tax. Another area is around wages. Um, so we did put out some figures about a month ago about just the extraordinary difference in what a chief executive in the fashion industry will earn compared to what a worker who's actually producing the garments in Vietnam will earn, and it is desperately horrific, the difference, the disparity, it's completely wrong. And this is where I think we have the real challenge about how we translate that into our own lives, because there's none of us want to buy into that, yet we all buy into that. So how do we actually challenge that? So we're, but there's also workers' power. So how we actually make sure workers are free to speak out and to really stand up um, for their rights and stand together. A third area is around services, so health provision, education provision. When governments are not able to collect the tax returns that they need, they cannot provide enough nurses, midwives, schools, teachers, the list goes on, or the infrastructure, so that's the third area. The fourth is climate change. We haven't mentioned climate so much this, this evening, but I can tell you now that, that we all know this. The people who are feeling the worst effects of climate change are the people who've done the very least to make it happen. Um, so that means really tackling both the, the mitigation measures, but also um, the actual uh, adaptation measures that we need on climate change as well. And underlying all of that, I have to just say, is gender justice is absolutely pivotal because... Uh, uh, Poverty has a female face, 
um, in tackling gender inequality, in making sure we actually do everything to fulfil women's rights, that will actually help all of those other areas as well. Thank you, sir. That's my abbreviated answer. There's much more. Fantastic. And a great model of brevity for us all to aspire to in our, in our, in our responses. Um, Catherine, can you do that? True. So I'll pick up on... Um, Matt's question and the question about the role of business too. Matt, I would love to talk later in a long answer, but um, I think there are tons and tons of quantitative measures. It's just we don't pay enough attention to them. So there, there's lots of different measures around uh, different wealth and income inequality, lots of measures around health, people's sense of feeling whether they're in control of life. There's even one that I refer to a lot. It's where GDP is corrected for the good stuff and, and the bad stuff, the genuine progress indicator, and that's been tracked for decades. And we can see since the late 70s a huge divergence between GDP per capita, which has kept going like that, and genuine progress, which is sort of largely plateaued, and because of inequality and environmental degradation because genuine progress captures both of those. So I think it's not so much a shortage of, of data, even though data could always be improved and it's patchy and it's not always comparable, but it's for me it's more what we pay attention to. Um, so that, that's part of it and how we take account of sort of the rebound effects and so on. I think that's what you're partly what you're hinting at with the if we're slowing slowing down the big and this is part of the challenge because we currently have a system that is geared up to rely on, on more and more growth. And so I'm picking that is an overwhelmingly structural challenge, but we, we, have, to, we have to try. The, the question about the role of business, I mean, I'm really excited ab about what business can bring to this conversation. Uh, I think business can be a hugely positive agent of change when it's purposed the right way. Um, there's a lot about the internal governance systems that restrict people who have got strong emotional intelligence, who care about these issues from actually aligning their activities with them because of internal governance systems and metrics and incentives within, the, within firms that are misaligned from what people and planet really need. So the idea of redesigning business. What's exciting is there is a flourishing of models that speak to that, whether it's benefit corporations or social enterprises or community interest companies or the, what's coming out of Europe, the economy from the, for the common good. There are heaps of people who are using the process of running a commercially viable enterprise but with a bigger purpose. And that's where I talk about profit as a vehicle rather than the, the end, ends in itself. And, and it's, it's really heartening. In, in terms of what policy can do, um, I'd say three things. One, procurement, not obviously the most exciting thing, but I think an incredibly powerful lever of, of how governments can decide where they put, bend their spend because governments are huge, got a huge budget at their disposal, and if they use, align that with these sorts of businesses, I think we can start in helping businesses respond. Uh, in term, also, just various the, the tax regimes and the way they encourage these sorts of pro-social business models and that sort of very, that wider flourishing terrain. And then, of course, education. Um, when people go to business schools or where they go to advice um, to business agencies, are they shown, right, here's the one model of business? Or you could have create a cooperative or you could create a benefit corporation or you create a social enterprise. So putting these things, again, in fair sight, I think, is a huge part of it. Great. Prime Minister. Your thoughts? Uh, about inequality, I think that inequality, injustice, and ex exclusion are three things that are coming, and if we don't do nothing, they are coming just like climate change is coming. Mm -hmm. But inequality, exclusion, and injustice are hitting our dignity and ordinary people's dignity, and that's the that's the actually the disastrous part of it, because it is ruining dignity of the people, those three things. So we have to do something with it, because it is like climate change. The difference with the climate change is climate change is going to hit us physically. So uh, we have to do something with those four things for, for the beginning. Uh, in that context, speaking about measures, about 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 how to, what how what to do with it? Uh, this morning I read the extraordinary 20 pages report that I printed. It's not uh, ecologically friendly, but I printed it uh, because it, I want to use it in different occasions where I'm not close to Wi-Fi. It is Oxfam report on reward work not wealth in 20 pages. 
And you have excellent guidelines, what the government should do, what the international organizations should do, and what corporations should do about hitting inequality. It's very well explained, and I can't agree more than that I'm going to use it in different occasions. So I suggest you to think about it seriously. Uh, I do. I do think seriously about it, and I'll do everything in my power to spread it around. Uh, when we started our Share Society project 10 years ago, we, after two, three years, we ended with 10 commitments. Yeah. What we should do about it, what governments, what individuals, what academics, what local communities should do about promoting Share Society. After two, three years, we realized that we have to go to the next stage of Share Society, which is economics of Share Society. Because basically speaking, our beginning of Share Society project was about the values, about respect, about the dignity of the people, about mutual understanding, about tolerance. So basically speaking, we looked like a priest. So we were preaching that it's nice to be nice. Then after two, three years, we decided to do an, uh, from another angle, that it is profitable to be nice in that way. So I mean, it does pay dividends when you promote shared society. And I suggest you, if you're interested in it, could go on our website along that, uh, along that line. And, 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 and the, I was, why I, I have to, uh, two points, short one. First one, I was, I used to be, if we were having this panel six months ago, I was much bigger pessimist than today. Okay. Okay, and then my son joined me for about uh, uh, Christmas, New Year's break in, in, in his university, and, and since he realized that I was kind of pessimistic by, why, by what I'm thinking about, and then he brought me Steven Pinker book, uh, The Better Signs of Our, The Better Angels of Our Nature. Uh, that's five, six years old book, and he said, look, I, I'll give you something to comfort you. The things are not that bad. And that's the reason why two days ago I went directly to Waterstone to buy the Enlightenment Now, which is uh, telling what we should do about actually to be more optimistic and how we can be and why we can be and we should be more optimistic with some guidelines. And my last point, as I said, I'll give two points. Uh, last point is about since we are here in institution, which is the educational institution. I think what we have to do, we have to focus very strongly and very much, and that's the major, maybe the major role of decision makers to invest more and more and more in education, in education, in education, mm -hmm. in lifelong, le lifelong learning, in e philosophy education, in sense of that we have to continue with our education as much as is possible. And I want to spend the rest of my life to being something which I did a long time ago, to remain a student. I want to learn. And I think it is very important that we learn because what we know today is not what is going to be true in a few weeks or months or years. And we have to constantly learn and evolve in that context, especially education that is, and I'll close with shared society, education which is do focus on knowledge, then to focus on skills, but the third element of education that we need to focus more is education of character. You can be brain scientist, you can be engineer, you can be whatever you want to, lawyer, but you have to be constantly educated about your own character. And that's, I think, what shared society is about. And what sustainability, sustainable development, what uh, shared environment, what caring of the planet, caring of the people, caring of production, it's actually a mindset that depends strongly on how we build collectively our character. And that's the role of education is simply getting bigger and, and bigger. So, yeah. so in that respect, I'm very optimistic, right? Yeah. Excellent. Well, optimism is a very good place to, to leave us with. And Prime Minister Koch, the Well, last thank you so much for, for, for the occasion and also for, for, for your presence and, and your, your lively participation in this in this discussion. I'm, I'm uh, for, for years and years a convinced supporter of the idea and the model of shared societies. Uh, and I, uh, I'm already a convinced supporter before I became a uh, member and later on president of the Club of Madrid because I experienced also in my own country, not always, but at certain occasions, how important it is to, at each and every level, to bring people together uh, to be prepared to listen to each other and to try to understand each other, if you dis even if you disagree. I mean, it starts and ends with respectful, being respectful for also the other mindset, the opposite mindset, but invest in, 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 in communication, in thoughtful 
discussion and and uh, uh, so together you can do uh, so much more than each of each individual alone so uh, and i'm also convinced that at the at the at the local level uh, a, a lot a lot of experience has already been built uh, and uh, one of the instruments we sometimes use is bringing uh, local representatives together, local governments together, stakeholders, and compare notes. Just, uh, it's of course important to be able to measure success, but also important to compare good and practices. And, and being together, sitting mm -hmm. together with local experiences in that respect is an enormous, um, enormous um, uh, achievement and to have that an enormous tool for for bringing people together from sometimes in a, in a region or, or within a country or outside uh, the country uh, so having said that uh, I think on top of everything we already knew um, uh, until a number of years ago uh, the climate change issue is not new but but uh, uh, time is running out uh, time is running out, and we, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit concerned that we are still not yet fully aware, uh, uh, also at national level, uh, not yet fully aware of what it, what it needs in terms of changing behavior of consumption, production, uh, 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 shift in mindset and shift and cultural shift. Uh, what it needs in order to meet uh, to meet uh, common targets. Uh, 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 so the complexity of all that is is uh, I think enormous, and the impact of all that will also be enormous for people individual and also for societies as a collectivity. And uh, I'm a bit concerned, and sometimes even more than a bit, about uh, the fact that in a world that is ever more interconnected and interdependent, where each of each and every one of us are so dependent on what happens elsewhere and the other way around, that you see at the same time that growing isolationism, uh, that growing uh, 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 populism, that uh, denial sometimes at the highest level of of facts that are so impressive that can should not be denied but are denied and uh, so this is not a match between between positive mindset and and and, and pessimistic mindset mm -hmm. this is more about concerns and how to tackle them uh, because uh, i fear that we don't have that much time and uh, of course ever always to build to build shared societies, that's all fine. And we have made a lot of progress and are making progress. But I sometimes have the feeling that we don't have sufficient time to tackle uh, uh, one of the most important challenges we face in our generation, namely uh, save the planet. Mm. Uh, but let's hope that, uh, that uh, also in this, this, this meeting, uh, this discussion, uh, 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 encourages again uh, that a common conviction, common conviction to uh, to other people in our environment, in our neighbourhood, uh, uh, close to us. Uh, uh, together with them, we can we can bring about changes that are necessary. And then, well, at the end of the day, the jury is still out if that will be enough, mm. and will be timely enough. But doing nothing is no option. Indeed. Thank yes, you so much. Thank you. So we end on a note of urgency, really, an urgency for this massive challenge we have to do, but also with a note of optimism and some options for actually getting some work done on the ground in our personal lives, at the national level, at the global level. There's stuff we can do, and we just have to do it. So the last thing we have to do is just thank our speakers for sharing their thoughts with us. Also to thank the uh, Club and Rafael from the Club of Madrid, our fantastic events team here at the Levantic School, and all of you for joining us for this very important discussion. Thank you, and good night.